Good morning and welcome to another SpireCast event. We are excited that you are here. Uh, my name is Chris Jefferson I'm with Spire Network and we are looking forward to being together at the Spire Conference September 14th through the 16th in Nashville, Tennessee at the Gaylord Opryland Convention Center and Resort. And uh, really, if you haven't had the opportunity yet to uh, jump online and register for this great event, uh, please do so at spire.network. That's spire.network. We are looking forward to being together. We're looking forward to the just the time of connection and collaboration and hearing from some fantastic speakers. We're excited to have uh, Craig Groeschel be our headline speaker and, and a variety of other folks, John Pacluda, uh, uh, Will Mancini, um, just a, a, a whole host of other great speakers that you will really, really enjoy and that will give us hopefully a lot of things to talk about and enjoy as we continue to work towards this idea of leading forward. Um, and we're uh, really excited to be able to revisit um, a, a talk that was given at the 2019 Spire Conference uh, by Carlos Whitaker. Uh, Carlos uh, gave a great talk called Kill the Spider. And we uh, looked at uh, episode one last week, and we'll finish that with part two today. Uh, but we're also really, really excited to have with us uh, today Dr. Alexander. Uh, Paul is the president of Hope International University um, and has also been a marriage and family therapist for more than 30 years and uh, also a good friend. So uh, let's go ahead and bring Paul on. We're so excited to be able to have um, your voice uh, with, uh, with us at this time. I know so many leaders uh, have really struggled uh, in a variety of different ways through the pandemic season, through political unrest, through all of these different things. And, you know, you've often said, um, uh, Paul, that um, this time of ambiguity, this time of uncertainty, this time of prolonged issue uh, is something that will lead to no doubt um, uh, a change in mental health for almost everybody. And so being able to recognize that and speak to that is something that I know you have done uh, throughout uh, this period of time. And so we've been so grateful for not only your work at Hope International, but also your work with so many leaders uh, who, who need that encouraging word. So I want to welcome you. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you, Chris. It's good to be a part of what you guys are doing. Um, and this, this is close to my heart. I'm looking forward to hearing the, the second part of the message. 
Um, so just thrilled to be here. Thank you. I don't really appreciate, uh, really appreciate all that you do. Um, if you'll remember from last uh, episode, Carlos, uh, in his talk, Kill the Spider, uh, was really talking and, and, and was very transparent and uh, provided some, some great information just about a struggle that he had. Uh, and uh, he had um, uh, some very quick fame. He had some very quick um, uh, recognition. And uh, Carlos began to dabble in sin, began to dabble in, uh, in and, and was, was, was caught in a moral failure. Uh, it cost him his family. It cost him his wife. It cost him his ministry. It cost him everything. And um, uh, very quickly, he had to um, uh, pursue a path of rightness and a path of righteousness in being able to change what he had uh, found himself um, in. And um, the, the, sometimes the choices that we end up making, the things that end up uh, taking place in our life brought on by a variety of different kinds of, of, of external um, of factors. Um, and however we get to a point of sin, when we recognize that we're in sin, um, being able to uh, trust the Lord for forgiveness, being able to trust the Lord for restoration, and being able to see that happen uh, is what Carlos uh, shared in his part one of Kill the Spider. And so um, uh, Dr. Alexander and I are going to uh, talk a little bit about part two when we come back and finish Carlos uh, Carlos's talk, but I wanted to be able to set it up for you so that you would be able to understand that we've just gone through this time of discussion in his talk, and now he's going to talk about dealing with some of those catalysts, some of those things that continue to either hold us down or keep us from being uh, all that God has intended for us to be. So, uh, Paul, when we come back, we'll be able to chat a little bit. If you have a question that you'd like to ask Paul or have us discuss, please drop it in the comment section. We'll be happy to get to that. Uh, but let's take a look at Carlos Whitaker from Spire Conference 2019 with Kill the Spider Part 2. He said, Carlitos, when I was in Panama preaching my very first revival, I gave the invitation for Jesus, and nobody came to the front. But one very old lady in the back of the church, she slowly makes her way to the front. And she looks at me and says, Pastor, can you pray for me? And he said, yes, I'll pray. Can you please pray that God would clean the cobwebs from my life? And I said, oh, it's very poetic. So we prayed, Lord, clean the cobwebs from Mr. Ramirez's life. He says, Carlitos, night numero dos, Mr. Ramirez, he comes to the front again. And she's still crying. And she says, Pastor, can you pray, but pray harder that God would clean the cobwebs from my life. So my dad said he prayed a little harder. He said, Carlitos, night numero tres, the last night of the revival, Ms. Ramirez comes to the front again. And she is still crying. And she asked me one more time, Pastor, can you pray one more time God would clean the cobwebs from my life? And my dad looked at her and said, no, we have been praying the wrong prayer. Tonight we do not pray he cleans the cobwebs. Tonight we pray that he kills the spider." Oh, yeah. You know. And when he said that, something shook inside of me because I realized this is what I've been doing. He said, Carlitos, you're a professional cobweb cleaner. You cannot simply keep going to your therapist named Al. Now, I just need you to imagine the one guy you know named Al. That's exactly what my therapist looked like, okay? So you got that? And keep cleaning your cobwebs. You must find the root and kill the spider. And so the beautiful thing, friends, is I did. Now I had language. I, I went to Al. And I identified my spider, I located my spider, and I cornered my spider. And as I, much as I believe in therapy and the natural, our help is the natural, but our hope is the supernatural. And what I realized in the moment right then when I saw the spiders, I can't kill my spider in a therapist's chair. The only way to kill your spider is with the blood of the cross and the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ in your life. And you guys know that. You believe that's why you're here. So I finally did, and I wrote a book called Kill the Spider, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to help as many people get there. And I know in a room with this many church leaders, there's a swarm of spiders in this room and a swarm of cobwebs. But most of us are cleaning our cobwebs. So let's put some definitions around it. What's a spider? A spider, remember the story, is an agreement you have made with a lie. Okay? Now here's the thing. You all have them. All my favorite preachers, Gene Apple has spiders in his life. Dave Stone has apples in his life. I've got, a, uh, uh, did I say apple spiders? <laughs> I'm hungry. <laughs> spiders in my life. And we all have spiders. We all have these agreements that we've made with lies. Those are in turn causing the behaviors we're trying to fix. But we spend 99% of our time not dealing with spiders but with cobwebs. So what's a cobweb? If a spider's an agreement, a cobweb is a medicator or behavior that brings false comfort to a lie. 
This is where we spend all of our time. And honestly, I'm tired of sermon series that deal with cobwebs. I'm tired of Medicator sermon series. We have to help our people find the agreement they've made with the lie and not help our people, help ourselves. And break that agreement, then freedom is there. What are some cobwebs? We know. Medicators, alcohol, right? I've seen alcohol destroy many people's lives. Alcohol is not the spider. Alcohol is the cobweb. So the person struggling with alcohol must find the agreement they've made with the enemy, break that agreement, the alcohol goes away. Pornography. Pornography, putting a porn blocker on your phone is not going to give you freedom. You've got to find the agreement you've made with the lie that the pornography is medicating. Uh, those are some pretty cobwebs. I mean, some ugly, how about some pretty cobwebs? How about you hardworking ministers out there? You hard workers? You, we're, we're, we're like, you are medicating a lie believing that somehow your identity or worth is based on some title or number you have achieved when your title is a son or daughter of God. We've got to break these agreements. We, we have to stop messing with the cobwebs. So how do we do it? Where do we get there? Well, the first step, you know what your cobweb is by, by asking your family, but you, you can't find out what your spider is by asking your family. You have to find out what your spider is by asking the Holy Spirit. And so Holy Spirit speaks to us still constantly. So we have to start paying attention. We have to pay attention. I honestly believe, I know that Holy Spirit is speaking. He was speaking this morning during that worship set. I mean, come on, can we thank this band one more time? I mean, that was incredible. <laughs> Holy Spirit was revealing all sorts of things to me then. And so we have to pay attention constantly to what he is speaking and what he is saying. My, my wife and I were on our way home from Ireland when I first started to understand this conversational intimacy with Jesus, what it means to really speak and to hear and to pay attention and see God. And the very first time he kind of blew my mind, my wife and I were at P.F. Chang's on the, on the, when we were on our way home from our anniversary trip uh, in the Detroit County Airport. And she was super jet lagged, extremely exhausted. And so I was trying to be a good husband and make her laugh. So I was telling her some funny stories that she didn't think were funny. And so finally, we, 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 I decided to tell her the story about this time I was leading worship and my percussion player forgot his egg shaker. You know the egg shakers that they shake it on stage? And so we had to go to Guitar Center. and They were out of egg shakers. They only had a shaker in the shape of a banana, which was a little awkward. So the whole time he was leading worship, he's got one hand in the air and he's shaking this banana in the air. And I, I thought it was, I don't know, kind of funny, like 17 of you guys thought. <laughs> but like the rest of you, my wife was like, That's, the banana story is not funny. She literally said that the banana story is not funny. I'm like, fine, check, please. So they bring the check, and every Chinese restaurant you've ever been to, wrapped in shrink wrap on top of the check is a what? A fortune cookie. I open up that fortune cookie. Friends and family, can you tell me what one word was on that fortune? Banana. Banana. Come on. I've opened a thousand fortune cookies in my life. They've all said, you'll meet a new friend this week. You'll make a lot of money next month. They've never been the fruit that I was just talking about. So I stand up, and I'm freaking out, and I'm like, ah. Babe, look. And this is what my wife says. She's so wise. She said, Carlos, we serve a whimsical God. We serve a fun God. If you're just looking for God to speak to you for an hour on Sunday, you're going to miss half of him. He's always speaking. Friends, I took that fortune home. I put it in a frame next to my bed. So every single morning I wake up, I roll over, and I'm reminded to pay attention. Now, I got half of you. The other half of you were like, oh, that's cute, but that's called a coincidence. Bro, listen, if you believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, you can't believe in coincidences anymore. You can't believe that anymore. And so if step one is to pay attention, and sorry, I'm going so fast. I've never preached this message in 25 minutes. That's why I'm talking so fast. <laughs> but if step one is to pay attention, we're going to hear from God. We pay attention. Step two is we hear from God when we ask questions. We don't serve a vague God. We serve a specific, laser-specific God. Yet our prayers are so vague. And I know why mine were vague. Because I was scared. If I got specific and he didn't answer, oh my gosh, crisis of faith, right? But here's the deal. When we get specific with God, he gets specific with us. I, I had a friend of mine named Marcus who who asked me to go to coffee because he said, I've never heard from God, Carlos, and I know you love to teach people on how to hear from God. And I said, yeah, let's go to coffee. So we go to coffee, and he, I think he thought I was going to give him three steps to hear from God, and he was going to go home and practice. But instead I said, okay, Marcus, you're going to hear from God right now. He goes, really? I said, yeah. I said, I want you to ask God where we should go to lunch. 
He's like, really? God's going to tell me where to go to lunch? I said, yeah. And he didn't want to pray because he didn't want to not hear. He was scared to death. I said, dude, you got to do it. He's like, and he started to sweat. And he crossed his fingers like this, and he kind of tilted his head up in the, towards the sky like this. He's like, dear God, or is that who I'm supposed to ask? I'll just, just keep praying. Where should me and Carlos go to lunch? Amen. And then I let him sit there super uncomfortably for like a minute. He was like, he kept picking up his phone. He's like, he was so, he was freaking out. I said, hey, relax. He said, I don't hear anything. I said, did you sense something? He goes, oh, feelings? Everybody has feelings. I said, Wait, don't edit the Holy Spirit. How many times do we edit the Holy Spirit, right? Oh, we're not editors. I said, what did you hear? What did you see? He said, well, I saw that Thai restaurant over in Titan Stadium parking lot called Thai Phuket. I said, well, let's go. So we go to Thai Phuket. We have a normal lunch. Jesus didn't appear in the steam of our soup. <laughs> Just kind of boring. We left. Marcus walked out in the parking lot. He got on his motorcycle. I got in my minivan. He's about 10 years younger than me. But either way, <laughs> as he gets on that motorcycle, I need you to imagine the most redneck human being you've ever met. Multiply it by 100. And that man came sprinting out of Tai Phuket. Hey, man. Hey, man, you. Hey, man, you. And he's shaking his finger like this. Hey, man, you. He's like, you're going to think I'm crazy, man. You're going to think I'm crazy. You're going to think I'm crazy. He ran up to us. He's like, you're going to think I'm crazy. And we were like, yes. He goes, man, you're going to think I'm crazy. And he looks at Marcus and he goes, do you sometimes work on your laptop over at that coffee shop called Frothy Monkey? Marcus is like, yeah. He's like, man, you're going to think I'm crazy. But I was in there just two weeks ago when I was praying. And you walked in there. And I felt like God told me to pray for you. But I was too chicken. So I just let you walk out. But now I'm sipping on my soup in here and you came walking in here. And oh my God, when you walked out, Holy Spirit was like, you can't let him leave. Chase him. So I chased you. Can I please pray for you? Marcus's eyes got this big, and I got in my minivan and left him in that parking lot with that weird man all by himself. Marcus called me 10 minutes later. He said, God answered my specific prayer. Friends, you want to know what your specific prayer is today? Holy Spirit, and he speaks. What is the agreement I've made with the lie? When he tells you to kill the spider, my whole book is 280 pages, only one page on how to kill the spider. Okay, Killing the spider is easy. Finding it is hard. You know how to kill it. You confess the lie in the name of Jesus. You reject the lie. And then you replace the lie with God's truth. Spiders die. Revival happens. How do you know it's dead? We got two scriptures. The first one is this. Romans 8, 6. For the mindset of flesh is death, but the mindset of the spirit is life. And peace. Not just life. Eternal life is incredible, but we actually get peace on this side of heaven. John 10, 10, for a thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I've come that they may have life and have it to the half. No. <laughs> to the full. We get that on this side. We get abundance on this side. That's incredible. And you get that in the midst of your trials, in the midst of your trauma. That's how you're going to know the spider's dead. And I, I want to give you a visual picture just to end. And this is what I think it's going to look like. And I know for a lot of people, especially many church workers who haven't heard from God in a long time, you may think, Carlos, I don't know. I don't know if I can pull this off. But let, me, let me show you what it's going to look like. My family and I, we were camping in the high Sierras. And um, we'll take that picture down if I don't ruin my punchline yet. Okay. Um, and, and so we're, we're camping. And my wife is like, hey, can you, um, um, can you take a picture of the stars? I said, well, Sure. So I went and I grabbed, she had one of those fancy cameras, you know, the buttons and the dials and the knobs and all this. I don't know how to use that camera. So, so there were millions of stars in the sky, so I, I grabbed the camera and I put it on auto mode, right? Because that's the mode you put a camera on when you don't know how to use it. <laughs> and, and, and I pointed that puppy at the sky and I took a picture. And now we can put that picture up. Th this was the picture that I took of the nine million stars in the sky. Now, I walked over to my wife and I said, hey, hey, babe, how's this? She's like, oh, do you know how expensive that camera was? I know that camera can take a picture of all the stars. I've seen it on Instagram. I was like, babe, but I don't know how to do that. She goes, I know, but do you have a friend? I said, oh. So I called my friend Jeremy. He's a professional photographer in Nashville. And I said, Jeremy, I'm trying to take a picture of the abundance of stars in the sky, but I only got like 19 stars. How do I do it? He goes, oh, is the camera in auto mode? 
I said, well, yeah. He said, like Yoda himself, you cannot capture the abundance of stars in auto mode. It has to be in manual mode. I said, yeah, but I don't know how to do that. He said, I know you don't know how to do that, but just trust me. If you do what I say, I want you to take the camera, and I want, to find, want you to find the ISO. I was like, what's an ISO? He find, finally found the ISO, and he said, crank the ISO from 100 to 12,000. Then you have to take the aperture, which is also called the f-stop, and you have to lower that thing from 8.3 to 1.2. Then you have to take the shutter speed, and you have to slow the shutter speed down from 1 30th of a second to 30 seconds. So all the light can evade the sensor. But if the shutter is that wide open, you can't hold it because then it's going to be blurry. So you have to put it on a tripod, download an app to remotely trigger it from your phone, and I just want a picture of the stars. And I tried it and I failed because it was hard and complicated. And I tried it and I failed and I tried it and I failed and I tried it and I failed. And an hour and a half later, I took a picture and this was the picture that I got. Can I tell you what this is? This is life to the full. This is life with abundance. This is what God has for us. But can we put the other picture back up? So many of us are walking around going, look at my 19 stars. How good is God? And God's like, I don't have 19 stars for you. I got to put the other picture back up. I have 19 million stars for you. This is available when you kill the spider. So friends, listen. This is where revival is going to take place. When the leaders in this room begin to eradicate the spiders in your life. And those that follow you will see suddenly this star picture in your life. That's when revival is going to spring forward in your churches. Let's pray. Lord, I'm grateful to be in a room of spider killers. So will you, Jesus, allow us to hear from you if we have not heard from you in years? Father God, will you be so loud and specific with every single one of us? For it is by the blood of the cross, the power of the resurrection, and the authority you've given every single believer in this room in your ascension that every person said amen. Amen. Well, it's been remarkable to see uh, just how um, poignant some of these uh, these talks from 2019 are and how relevant they are, even though we have gone through uh, something recently that, that nobody could have foreseen uh, that we didn't know was coming. Uh, and all of those challenges uh, make make the message no less relevant and um, uh, important. And I really appreciated uh, Carlos's um, uh, message and really appreciated really him identifying what the spider is. Paul, and, and, and the idea that the spider is an agreement that you have made with a lie. And there are a lot of different ways that we get to that spot or we get to that level of thinking. And uh, I know that uh, there's a lot of different, I don't want to say a, a lot of different uh, triggers, but there are a lot of different things that can get us into a point where our thinking becomes compromised or our thinking becomes um, um, you know, detached from truth and reality. And we are uh, given over to, uh, to thinking about a lie and to uh, you know, really allowing that lie to take up residence and live in our lives. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's a profoundly... Um, thought inspiring uh, message from Carlos, because uh, I think what he's doing is, is forcing us to ask the question, you know, in my life, is there a spider? And, and if there is, what am I going to do about it? And for Christian leaders, for pastors, it is a really intimidating thought uh, to think that I have to address the spider because who do we talk to about it? And that's really one of the biggest barriers for mental health and emotional health for pastors is, who in the world can I trust um, to talk to about this? I mean, I can't, I can't trust the elders. I'm very reluctant to tell a peer. I'm reluctant to tell anybody that's attached to my church and my paycheck. So I'm going to handle this on my own, right? So um, anxiety, uh, depression, addictions flourish in the heart and lives of Christian leaders because we don't know who our peers, trustworthy peers can be. And so these little lies start as a place for comfort, uh, for security, for relief, for release, um, for thrill. Um, just And it's usually a coping mechanism. I'm feeling alone. I'm not feeling appreciated. Um, I'm going to just dabble, right? And one of the lies is I can do this and be okay. Mm -hmm. And I can do this and no one will know. And, and that starts spinning quickly. 
So, you know, which ones are the are the real spiders and which ones are just kind of more like gnats, right? So there are certain things that I do. If I if I sneak off and get a giant lunch and don't tell my wife, well, that's not a spider. Uh, you know, that's a garter snake, but it's <laughs> it's not a deadly spider. So one of the things we tell ourselves is, well, these are all small deals. And yet some of these are really, truly spiders. So um, sin, uh, addiction, pornography, substance use and abuse, um, starting to pour into someone other than my spouse, starting to share those kinds of things. And it happens insidiously and really slowly. And that's one of Satan's schemes is that this doesn't occur overnight. This occurs over months and sometimes years. And we keep justifying. And we know we're justifying right? The things we tell ourselves as we spin the web are pretty fascinating. So when we do postmortems with people a month after a, a failure or five years after a failure, they kind of shake their head at the things they told themselves um, as they were trying to cope. Mm -hmm. You know, it's fine. It's, you know, um, one, of, one of mine in my life at times has been, well, you know, David was a man after God's own heart and he screwed up a lot. So it's okay if I act David-esque today, right? Whatever the issue Right, that you can find examples of people who have done X, Y, and Z, when in fact, if we will slow down long enough, we know that there are times when we're doing things that are destructive. Mm -hmm. Right, I'm engaging in a way of thinking or behaving that is pulling me away from my Lord. And I, I will just confess that I know when I have been dancing with spiders, when I'm convicted in the middle of worship. So when I'm, I go to Eastside Christian Church here in Anaheim, when I, when we sit on the front row on purpose, because I have, man, I have church ADHD. And if I'm in the back, I'm watching people instead of, instead of listening, we sit on the front row. And when the, when the worship is full, I can feel in my heart when there's a tug or a pierce of my soul. And I realize I've been dancing with spiders. Now, usually it's small as spiders, yeah. but there are things that just pull us away. And, and my contention is we're, we're smart people. If we will just slow down and ask the Lord, like Carlos was saying, to reveal it, he will. He will reveal the things that have been hurting us, impeding us, restricting us, and constricting us. That's a long answer to your, your question, your setup. Oh, but. Very good. And, you know, one of those things that... Um, you know, I know we're going to be talking about at the Spire Conference when when uh, Craig Groeschel's with us is really that premise to uh, his new book, which is uh, that, that scriptural uh, direction to make every thought obedient unto Christ. And when we allow for the opportunity for a lie to have a place in our mind and to have a place where we, you know, create a sense of reality for it, or we, uh, we, we, we may not do it all at one time, but over a period of time, that behavior, the behavior of the cobwebs, the behavior of the self-medication, whatever that is, right, becomes something that does prop that lie up and make it stronger and make it more, uh, more apparent. And when you have a, 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 an onstage persona, and a backstage persona, right? As almost all leaders uh, and, and, and pastors have, uh, your front of house persona has a certain, um, um, it, a certain identity that must be kept up. And the backstage, all of those things that are, um, uh, you know, difficult to talk about, uh, everything from, you know, anxiety or depression or, you know, maybe it's a substance or, or, or pornography or whatever those things are, um, tend to want to hide those backstage things and hide them from the very people who might be able to help, might be able to, uh, to, to, to encourage. I know that um, especially with depression and anxiety, those can in fact become very distinct cobwebs in people's lives and, and things that keep them from being um, 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 their best selves. And I know that that is an area that you have specifically worked uh, very diligently with. And, uh, you know, how, I mean, in ministry, how prevalent have you found uh, depression and anxiety Anxiety to be some of the cobwebs that these lead, that leaders uh, deal with. Well, um, so I'll give you a super quick backstory. So three years ago, um, I was contacted by uh, my pastor to see if I would come do a, an in-service for the staff, 80 people and staff at my church on depression and ministry, because 
Um, in our area in Southern California, we'd had three pastors take their own lives mm -hmm. in a very short period of time. So, you know, the pastor world is a small knit community. Everybody knew someone who knew someone related to um, one, two or three of these men. So that began um, a number of invitations. And over the past three years, I've spoken to 2,200 pastors. And I will say this, having, having done all these presentations, it's much more common than we think. Mm -hmm. So general population depression is 6% of the population. Um, general population anxiety is 18%. So one in four in the general population are struggling with depression and anxiety. My, my experience with pastors has been um, it's 10, 15, 20% higher than that for folks in ministry, simply because they're embarrassed. Mm. How can I, on the one hand, say Jesus is my all and Jesus is everything, and then in my backstage persona, I'm depressed and or anxious. So um, there have been a lot of tears uh, when I've spoken and a lot of folks who have thankfully decided to, to do something about the cobwebs. And for pastors, man, the, there's extra glue on the cobwebs because there's embarrassment, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I just don't want to tell anyone. Um, I was talking to a well-known pastor in my office here, actually at this table, my conference table, um, a few months ago, and he has been public about his struggle with very intense anxiety. So I was talking to him and I said, I want to commend you because you decided very quickly to be honest about mental health issues when it took me 30 years um, to be comfortable enough to talk about how I've managed mild depression my whole adult life. Mm -hmm. And he said when he was he was really kind of overcome by anxiety, having never gone through it before. And he said, I had a choice to make. Was I going to pretend I was OK or was I going to be transparent? And I said, well, God bless you for being transparent. And here's what's interesting. The Monday night after he decided to tell his church what he was going through, normally they had 20 to 25 people show up for a prayer meeting. The Monday night after he shared his struggle with panic attacks, he had 300 people come. Wow. The line wrapped around the, the building they were in, and the pastor and the elders prayed for people one by one hmm. because they responded so positively to his transparency. Now, he was a veteran pastor who was beloved. Mm -hmm. He had the capital to do that. If you're brand new on staff, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. That's that's a risky call, right? The the old school pastors would say never do that. The millennials have no problem uh, doing this. They'll they'll uh, they'll be pretty pretty transparent. But I we have to break through the shame and embarrassment. Um, yeah. We have to take away some of the stickiness of the cobweb and just admit, man, it's hard to be a pastor. It, it's hard to find the kind of support. Uh, that we need. And I think it's it, there's a real paradox, an awful paradox, that sometimes the driest places spiritually are in service to the king. Mm -hmm. Because we're giving, 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 and we're not necessarily making sure that we're replenishing. And we even feel guilty when we replenish. Right, right. So interesting that, that those uh, points of depression and anxiety become those cobwebs, right, that uh, all start with a different kind of lie. You know, in Carlos's situation, his lie was that he could dabble in sin and nobody would know. He could dabble in sin and not get caught, right? Uh, but uh, oftentimes it's not necessarily a moral failure, but sometimes it's um, the, the fear, right? The fear that I, I'm not yep. going to be enough. The fear that I'm not going to be able to achieve what I need to achieve in order to find success or that somehow you put yourself in that position of, of achievement and, and, and a need to succeed instead of uh, the obedience of uh, allowing God to, uh, to, 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 to be in charge of, of the, the, the things that are happening in your church. And so that is another kind of lie. And sometimes the, 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 the pressure of all those things, whether it's, you know, staff pressures or whether it's elder pressures or you know, all of those different things can compound and a different kind of lie then uh, brings about some of those depression, anxiety tendencies. And we tend to look at it as, uh, or, or, or people might have the, um, uh, the tendency to look at that like it's some sort of spiritual problem, right? And it's not. I mean, how much of this is a spiritual problem, Paul? So that's one of the most complicated questions when it comes to depression and anxiety. I mean, the, the, I, I have thought about this all weekend, right? Because I thought mm -hmm. I thought you might ask that question. In a sense, uh, it's almost none of the problem. In another sense, it's it's completely the problem. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Um, because so I have six. I'm going to run through them really fast. I'm not going to enumerate them. I'm just going to list them. So if people can watch this later and they can stop and they take notes. I don't have a, I don't have a cool graphic to hold up and show you. But <laughs> so when I look at my 30 years of clinical experience, I've found six causes of depression and anxiety. So number one is just life, um, the wear and tear of life. Number two is biology and brain behavior. Look at your family tree. Number three is the quality of our relationships. How are my relationships doing? Are they broken? Are they whole? Number four is lifestyle. And by that, I mean, you're either getting way too much rest or not enough rest. Number five are spiritual issues. Um, am I in tune with the Lord? Is my, is my root going deep? And then finally, the sixth one that we don't think very much about is trauma. Hmm. So, I mean, you could say that because everything is spiritual, spiritual cause is, is behind all the other five, but that's not been my experience. There are people who are, love the Lord with all their heart and yet still have these, these painful um, bouts and seasons of depression and anxiety. One of the um, life-changing books for me that I've read in the area was a biography of Mother Teresa called Come Be My Light. Um, it didn't, it wasn't very popular. Uh, and there was a lot of, um, there were a lot of upset Catholics who were really angry uh, that the keepers of her letters would release this book, but it described her lifelong struggle with serious depression. Right, so here's Mother Teresa, this this saint in Calcutta doing the Lord's work, and she had an aching, aching sense of depression her whole life. Was that a spiritual problem? No, it it was caused by other things. Now, who knows what it was, but um, we don't know how these things will all interplay with one another, and we certainly have to ask the spiritual question. You know, am I in tune with the Lord? Am I allowing Him to confront the big L lies in my life? Mm-hmm. But we also have to look at my lifestyle, the quality of my relationships. Have I had traumas I haven't had to deal with? I know in my own um, melancholy and, and bouts of fear, it took me years to realize that there was a an earthly spider deep in my cave mm-hmm. that I didn't realize was even bothering me. When I was six years old, my dad almost died of cancer. Um, he had a very... Um, awful surgery, took out a bunch of tissue in his neck. Mm. And I remember as a little guy, but I had blocked it, how much fear that created in me that my father, my idol, um, was going to be taken. And and years and years later, um, something connected for me watching a movie about cancer. And I realized it had caused this kind of root of fearfulness about health that I didn't even know was there. That was, mm-hmm. was spinning off all kinds of other worries and and issues. The hard thing with depression and anxiety, though, is sometimes there's no root that we can find. Mm-hmm. There's no sin. There's no trauma, right. right? Relationships are okay-ish. Work is okay-ish. And yet there's this kind of this dull fog, right? So the the big lie for us in Christian mental health work is um, the the inability for folks to take charge of their own mental health. And I want to say that again, because it's it's mm. common sense, but it's also confront uh, confrontational. But I want people to think about it. If you're stuck in the fog and the fog's not lifting, who other than you is going to help you find your way out? Well, certainly the Holy Spirit, right? right? And certainly your Christian community, but, but you have to take steps out of the fog and, and out of the cave and get away from the spiders. But when you're depressed and when you're anxious, mm-hmm. that is the hardest thing to do, mm-hmm. to take those first steps. So what we've been trying to do with, with our seminars here at Hope and what you guys have been trying to do on the mental health side, spiritual health side of, of Spire, is just trying to light a, a, a fire under people mm-hmm. and encourage them to take steps. Because deep down, we know we need some help. Mm-hmm. So true. And for, for some folks, just the taking the step of identifying a trusted mentor that you can talk to is a great first step. Sometimes just finding, you know, the, 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 the will to call a trusted counselor, right? It, it becomes difficult because it's, it's, I think for many pastors and leaders, it's not just about finding a good Christian counselor, but it's about finding a counselor that can specialize in understanding the unique needs 
that pastors and leaders have in the church because of this front of house and back of house life that they are living. So one of the things that we are really excited about being able to offer at Spire Conference is we're going to have um, um, licensed coaches and counselors uh, there um, and, and um, um uh, available for um, uh, you to be able to uh, have some uh, meetings with and to be able just to, to find some folks to talk with. It's been a very difficult season of ambiguity and challenge. And so we want to make sure that uh, even if the opportunity to get away for a few days and be a part of Spire Conference gives you the opportunity to start a conversation with someone who understands pastors, who understands leaders, who understands the difficulty that things um, are, uh, that, that things have, have brought about in terms of the lives of pastors and leaders. We want to be able to create that moment for that step to be taken. And so, um, um, Paul, I know you're going to be there. You're going to be there uh, as part of um, um, uh, just our, our our Spire team and uh, being able to encourage and and uh, and um, speak good words to pastors. We are really excited about. About our time together. Um, are there any other things that you would say would be great first steps? Maybe uh, you're, you're, you're timid about being able to have that conversation or you're timid about being able to take that first step. Any other really good first steps that pastors and leaders can take in order to deal with anxiety, depression, or the cobwebs that they're facing? Yeah. So, uh, you know, pen and paper, I would pull aside for 30 to 120 minutes in the next few days. Mm -hmm. And I would just start simply listing um, pressures and stressors in my life. Just start there. What, mm -hmm. you know, what are the pain points? Um, so sit down and say, well, what are the things that I'm anxious about? What are the things that I'm stressed about? And then the second thing on the list would be, um, when did things start feeling different for me? Right. So was it three months ago? Was it the first day we had to do something COVID related mm. or did it go pre COVID? Right. So when did things start feeling off? When did I start feeling anxious? When did I start feeling like I was in a funk? And then the third thing would begin to, to list your small network of people that you could trust to talk to. Mm. And I wouldn't make it bigger than three. So mm. one, two or three people uh, that you can share with. Now, for most pastors, I recommend talking to somebody out of your area. Um, it's it's nice to have somebody in your area, but it's also nice to have someone that you're not going to run into at Home Depot, right? right? That you can have this conversation with um, and, and really unwind. For me, it's my friend 90 minutes from here. He's a pastor of a medium-sized church. We met in college. We're good friends. He'll come and, and tell me how awful things are at his church, and I'll, I'll go up there and tell him how awful things are at, at Hope, right? So that's not real, but that's the feeling, sure. right? Those days when I need to talk to someone. So, um, you know, what are my stressors? When did things change? And then who can I talk to? And then finally, if if you realize that, that there's more weight on the page than you thought there was going to be, I guess step four would be, can I talk to a Christian therapist? Um, and if I can't, what's stopping me? Um, your elders would support you doing this. And my guess is they'd probably even pay for it. Now, I couldn't say that at the beginning of my career, mm -hmm. but now uh, we're okay with Christian counseling, yeah. right? We're okay with it. So identify a Christian therapist uh, that can help you figure out, is this, a, is this a big S spider or a little S spider? And what are the little steps um, that we can take together? It's a collaborative relationship. So find someone to collaborate with. Mm -hmm. I'm so grateful, Paul, for um, your uh, your help and your leadership and your wisdom in this area and your uh, heart and desire uh, to speak into leaders. And every time we have the chance uh, to talk, I learn something. And I just appreciate that uh, deeply uh, from you. Um, I, I'm really excited to be able to see you at Spire Conference and to be able to uh, to talk further about um, uh, these plans that we have to um, uh, include uh, pastor health and resiliency as a um, um, uh, as, a, as a, an area of, of, of service that Spire is offering. And we want to be able to point to 
uh, so who, who are those great counselors? Who are those great uh, helpers? Who are those great therapists that that specialize in uh, any manner of, uh, of, of discussion for leaders who they can trust and that they can uh, find uh, opportunity? I'd also point to the Spire app. You know, one of the great things about the Spire mobile app that we created was the opportunity to form groups and to be able to have mentorship conversations right through the app in a way that your data is not going to get sold. Your data is not going to get marketed, right? And so to be be able to uh, to do that in, in a way there there are some great tools that I think allow us to be closer and more connected than than maybe we ever have or ever thought that we were uh, so really appreciate you being with us today Paul really appreciate the opportunity just to be able to hear what Carlos had to say in 2019 remember that fondly and uh, take those words to heart as we uh, seek out those lies that we have fostered that we have allowed to uh, to, to remain and I um, uh, to, uh, to to speak truth to them and replace them with truth so that we can live in the fullness uh, that God has always intended uh, for us. If you haven't had the opportunity again to register for Spire Conference, we absolutely would love to see you there. Uh, please go to spire.network, sign up, all of the housing, all the information, golf tournament, all the different things are there uh, for you to take part in. We can't wait to see you. We know that for so many, it's just so needed. We're going to talk about all the things that we need to leave behind. We're going to talk about the challenges that we're facing presently as leaders. And we're going to talk about what's the future look like? How do we, how do we begin to move again in this, uh, in this movement that, uh, that we all love so dearly? Uh, so thank you again, Paul, for being with us. Um, we look forward to uh, the next time that we get to be together. And um, uh, please um, uh, remember that whatever the step is that you may need to take, uh, finding the courage to do it will uh, absolutely uh, be well worth it in the end. Thank you all so much. Have a great rest of the day. Take care.